Now we're nearing the end of the book of Second Kings. We should be able to finish it in this session. Uh, we turn at this point to the 23rd chapter. And in chapter 22, we found that Judah had its final good king rise to power. His name was Josiah. And in his day, Hilkiah the priest found a copy of probably Deuteronomy. The Bible just says they found a copy of the book of the law. But the particular reaction he had sounds as if what he read was Deuteronomy. Because the king, upon having it read to him, realized that the nation was under God's curse and under God's judgment because of all their idolatry. And certainly of, of the various books of Moses, uh, Deuteronomy is the one that would seem to give that impression upon being read at that period of time in history. And so, uh, upon hearing it, Josiah sent some of his messengers to a prophetess named Huldah and asked her, you know, what, what the Lord's mind was about this matter. And she said, yeah, just everything the book said would happen is going to happen. Uh, God's going to judge Judah, and they're going to be very badly uh, hurt by their enemies. But, she said, Josiah himself, because his heart was tender toward God, would not live to see that day. He would die short of that time coming. He actually died fairly young, as a matter of fact. And we will, of course, read of his death in this chapter that we're coming to now, though not immediately. In chapter 23, it says, Then the king sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah, and with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. <coughs> then the king stood by, a pillar and made a covenant between or before the Lord and followed the Lord excuse me made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people took their stand <coughs> for the covenant that is to say they made a public statement of agreement to the public to the covenant um, so did the people in Moses day by the way You'll recall that in Exodus 19, when God first entered into covenant, he told the Jews that if they would keep his covenant, that they'd be his special people, and they said, we'll do it. Everything God said, we'll do. But in a very short time, they were building golden calves. Uh, <clears throat> their profession of love for God was very external, and this is the case with the people in Josiah's day also. Although Josiah was personally sincere, <coughs> Uh, we find that the people did not, their, their affection for God did not go very deep. And uh, so they seemed to outwardly agree to the covenant. And they said, okay, yeah, we should do that. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, the priests of the second order and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. Uh, probably Bethel because that's the next place he needed to desecrate. Took the ashes of this idolatry and took it to this city which had been the center of idolatry which he also was going to destroy uh, in the northern kingdom. Now at this time Israel, the northern kingdom ceased to had ceased to exist. <clears throat> Excuse me. It fell to uh, Assyria earlier than this time. And, of course, it had been repopulated by persons brought in by the Assyrians. But it's hard to know exactly how much direct control and oversight the Assyrians gave the region. And, uh, actually, uh, Josiah, the king of Judah, acted as if that region was under his control. And he may have acted under uh, permission from the Assyrians, or he may have just gone on in there and trusted the Lord to protect him in what he did. But he got away with it. It says... He took the ashes of all these things and he uh, took them to Bethel. Then, verse 5, he removed the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense on the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places all around Jerusalem and those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations and to all the hosts of heaven. And he brought out <coughs> the wooden image 
from the house of the Lord to the brook Kidron outside Jerusalem, burned it at the brook Kidron and ground it to ashes and threw its ashes on the graves of the common people. Then he tore down the ritual booths of the perverted persons, apparently the, the sodomites from the temple of Asherah, and were in the house, that were in the house of the Lord. Apparently they brought the, the sodomite priests of Asherah right into the temple prior to this where the women wove hangings for the wooden image. And he brought all the priests from the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense, from Geba to Beersheba. Also, he broke down the high places at the gates, which were at the entrance of the gate of of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were to the left of the city gate. Nevertheless, the priests of the high places did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they ate unleavened bread among their brethren. And he defiled Tophet, which is also, uh, as it says here, uh, in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Now, this particular valley is where Moloch's statue had stood, in the valley of Hinnom. That's where they caused their children to pass through the fire to Moloch. And so, Josiah defiled that place. And we're not, it's not clear what it means that he defiled it, uh, but he did things there to render it unclean. He destroyed the altars and all that. And, and it turns out that at this point, the Valley of Hinnom was transformed by the Jews from a place of worship of Moloch into a place of a uh, garbage dump. And uh, perpetual fires were allowed to burn there. And it was sort of the garbage dump of Jerusalem that they took all the garbage and the refuse and and such, and they threw it there, and they kept the fires burning perpetually. And uh, the images of hell in the New Testament are often drawn from the image of this valley of Hinnom, uh, or the land of Hinnom, in the Greek, is Gehenna. And that's the word that Jesus used more often than not when he spoke of hell. When he says, better to pluck out your eye than have both eyes and be cast into to hell, he used the word Gehenna, which simply means the valley or the land of Hinnom. But he used that image because uh, the Jews were familiar with this place. It was a garbage dump. It was a place where fires burned continually. And uh, like hell, it was a place where the fires were perpetual. And it it became that in the days of Josiah. He defiled Tophet. That was a place where Moloch had been worshipped there and transformed the valley of the son of Hinnom into this garbage dump. That no man might make his son or daughters pass through the fire to Moloch. Then he removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance to the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the officer who was uh, in the court. And he burned the chariots of the sun with fire. So some horses and chariots had been dedicated to the sun god. And he removed the horses and burned up the chariots. The altars that were on the roof, the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, And the altars which Manasseh had made uh, in the two courts of the house of the Lord, the king broke down and pulverized there and threw their dust into the brook Kidron. Some of the uh, idolatrous stuff that Manasseh had established did not fully get disestablished when Manasseh repented. He did break down idols and and he broke down uh, shrines to idols. But apparently he had so uh, filled the land with idolatry that in the remaining part of his lifetime, after he repented, he was not able to do everything in terms of getting rid of all the trappings. So Josiah finished that up and took down those altars which were made by Manasseh. Uh, Then the king defiled the high places that were east of Jerusalem, which were on the south of Mount uh, of the Mount of Corruption. Um, The Mount of Corruption is probably a symbolic name uh, for the Mount of Olives, which was on the east side of Jerusalem. Uh, Why it was called the Mount of Corruption, I'm not sure. Possibly that was a contemptuous name that was given to it because certain idols had been worshipped there. So, um, the king defiled the high places that were east of Jerusalem, which were on the south side of the Mount of Corruption, or the Mount of Olives, which Solomon, king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Sidonians, of Chemosh, uh, for Chemosh, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he broke in pieces the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden images 
and filled their places with the bones of men. This is possibly how he defiled all the places, filling their places with the bones of men, just going to some nearby cemetery, uh, getting all the bones of the dead out and scattering them there because dead bodies or contact with dead bodies was a defiling thing. This would make the region a place no one would want to go because uh, with these dead bones all around, anyone who went there would be defiled and uh, they'd, they'd therefore lose certain social privileges uh, from the defilement. And so by defiling them in this way, probably he hoped to keep people from ever going there again and renewing the, the idolatry that had been practiced there. Verse 15, Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel. Now, this is important. Bethel was in Israel. You know, that's where one of the gold calves had been. Dan and Bethel were those two places that Jeroboam had established. And the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made, both that altar and the high place, he broke down and he burned the high place and crushed it to powder and burned the wooden image. As Josiah turned, he saw the tombs that were there on the mountain. And he sent and took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar and defiled it, according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed who proclaimed these things. You'll recall back in 1 Kings 13, when Jeroboam had established the worship of the golden calf there and built an altar, that uh, an unnamed prophet, who was later killed by a lion, uh, had come and, and prophesied against the altar. And in 1 Kings 13, 2, he had specifically mentioned that a man named Josiah will come and he'll defile this altar with the bone and the priest will be burned at it. The priest that officiate this altar will be burned at it. Well, at the time Josiah arrived, there were no more priests officiating it, but their bones, the bones of those priests were burned on it. So this was a fulfillment of that prophecy <clears throat> by a man, amazingly, also named Josiah. And he sent and took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar and defiled it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed who proclaimed these words. Verse 17. Then he said, What gravestone is this that I see? And the men of the city told him, It is the tomb of the man of God who, had, who came from Judah and proclaimed these things which you have done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, Let him alone. Let no one move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet who came from Samaria. Remember, the old prophet was buried next to that prophet, and so their bones were left undisturbed as an honor to them. Then Josiah also took away all the shrines <clears throat> of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria. Again, this was not technically in his jurisdiction. This is the region that had been conquered by Assyria from the northern kingdom. But apparently he got permission to do this, or else he just moved in at a time where there was a not very powerful government. Probably came in with his troops and did what he did. And maybe just it may be that no one challenged him on it. Then Josiah also took away the shrines, the high places of the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger. And he did to them according to all the deeds that he had done in Bethel. Verse 20, he executed all the priests of the high places who were there on the altars and burned men's bones on them. <clears throat> and he returned to Jerusalem. So where there were high, where there were priests, it says he's, he executed the priests and he burned them on the altars. It appears that in, in these places there were still priests offering on these altars. Although Israel had been removed, uh, perhaps some of the Israelites had come back and there was a mixture of Israelites and pagans there. Anyway, he, he exercised the initiative to kill the priests, whoever they may have been, at those altars at this time. Then the king commanded all the people saying, keep the Passover... To the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of the covenant. Now, you remember that Hezekiah had also uh, reinstituted the Passover, which had been neglected in his day. Now, it probably hasn't been kept since then. And so, Josiah requires the people to keep Passover. There are some details about this Passover in Second Chronicles 35. <clears throat> I'd like to read about it in the first 17 verses of that chapter. Second Chronicles 35, 1, says, Now Josiah kept a Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem, and they slaughtered the Passover lambs on the fourteenth day of the first month. And he set the priests in their duties and encouraged them for the service of the house of the Lord. Then he said to the Levites, who taught all Israel, who were holy to the Lord, Put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, built. It shall no longer be a burden on your shoulders. Now serve the Lord your God and his people Israel. 
So apparently they've been carrying the ark. I'm not sure. Maybe they carried it around to these places where he was desecrating the pagan altars. Maybe the priests were bringing the ark there uh, just as symbolic of God taking that territory from the idols. And now he says, now bring the ark, take it off your shoulders and put it back in the Holy of Holies of Solomon's temple. Prepare yourselves according to your father's houses, according to your divisions, following the written instruction of David, king of Israel, and the written instruction of Solomon, his son. And stand in the holy place according to the divisions of the fathers' houses of your brethren and the lay people, and according to the division of your fathers' houses of the Levites. So slaughter the Passover offering, sanctify yourselves, and prepare them for your brethren, that they may do according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Then Josiah gave the lay people lambs and young goats from the flock, all for Passover offerings, for all who were present to the number of 30,000, as well as 3,000 cattle. These were for the kings, from the king's possessions. And his leaders gave willingly to the people, to the priests and to the Levites, Hilkiah, Zechariah, and Jehiel, rulers of the house of God, gave to the priests for the Passover offerings, 2,600 from the flock and 300 cattle. Also, Kananiah, his brother Shemaiah, and Nathaniel, um, Nathaniel, or something like that, um, and Hashabiah, and Jael, and Jozebed, chief of the Levites, gave to the Levites for Passover offerings 5,000 from the flock and 500 cattle. <coughs> so, just so that the citizenry would be able to have something to offer. And uh, even, apparently even so that the poor who couldn't afford animals could have something to offer. The king and the rulers and the priests gave uh, from their own substance a lot of animals for the normal people who didn't have animals to offer to give. So the service was prepared and the priests stood in their places and the Levites in their divisions according to the king's command. And they slaughtered the Passover offerings and the priests sprinkled the blood with their hands while the Levites skinned the animals Then they removed the burnt offerings that they might give them (coughs) to the divisions of the fathers' houses of the lay people to offer to the Lord as it is written in the book of Moses. And so they did with the cattle. Also they roasted the Passover offerings with fire according to the ordinance. But the other holy offerings they boiled in pots and cauldrons and in pans and divided them quickly among all the lay people. Then afterward they prepared portions for themselves and for the priests. Because of the priests, the sons of Aaron were busy offering burnt offerings and fat until night. Therefore, the priests prepared portions for themselves and for the priests, the sons of Aaron. Apparently, that means that (coughs) the priests kept so busy serving the people and offering their sacrifices for them that they didn't have time to eat until nighttime. And so, last of all, they sacrificed for themselves. And the singers, the sons of Asaph, were in their places. According to the command of David, Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun, the king's seer. Also, the gatekeepers were in each gate. They did not have to leave their position because their brethren... The Levites prepared portions for them. So the gatekeepers didn't have to leave because the food was brought to them uh, from the sacrifices that were done on their behalf. So all the service of the Lord was prepared the same day to keep the Passover and to offer burnt offerings on the altar of the Lord according to the command of King Josiah. And the children of Israel who were present kept the Passover at that time and the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days. There had been no Passover kept in Israel like that since the days of Samuel the prophet. And none of the kings of Israel kept such a Passover as Josiah kept. Now, Hezekiah had kept a pretty big one, but this apparently is saying that Josiah's Passover, uh, in terms of its, uh, I don't know, in terms of its uh, fervency, purity, or maybe just the the bulk of its offerings or whatever, uh, even must have exceeded that of Hezekiah. Now, going back to 2 Kings 23... Verse 22 agrees with what we just read. Surely such a Passover had never been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was held before the Lord in Jerusalem. Moreover, verse 24, Josiah put away those who consulted mediums and spiritists, the household gods and idols, all the abominations that are seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book of Hil- that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Now before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all 
the law of Moses, nor after him did arise any like him. It's interesting that it says this about him, because something very similar was said about Hezekiah. It says of Hezekiah in 2 Kings 18.5, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any who were before him. Now, <clears throat> of both of these kings, it says that their devotion to God was greater than any king before them and greater than any king after them. Now, if this is taken to be entirely literal, that would mean that each was unique and unsurpassed in history. And yet, one must have surpassed the other. Or even if we would say that they were about equal, that doesn't satisfy the wording. It says there was none like him in this respect. He didn't have an equal. Now, how can you have two kings at different times in history, both of whom it is said they had no equal ever before or after them? I bring this to your attention for the purpose of acquainting you with the language of Scripture and the idioms of the Hebrews. It is said of Solomon at one point that he was wiser than any man before or than any man after him would be. And yet Jesus was wiser than he. It is said of the locust plague that came upon Egypt in the days of Moses that there had been no such locust plague before, nor would there ever be afterward. And yet in Joel, you read of another locust plague. In Joel 2.5, it says there's never been one like it before. Never will be one like it afterward. Furthermore, in the prophets, when they predicted the Babylonian captivity, on at least one occasion it was said that what God would do to Jerusalem, he had never done anything like it before and would never do anything like it afterward. And yet in 70 AD, he did something very much like it again. Now, I'm not saying this in order to cast doubt on the reliability of Scripture. Far from it. It's very clear that the writer of Second Kings was aware that he said this remark about Hezekiah and, and that he said it also about Josiah. And if one wanted to argue, well, maybe this wasn't all one author, well, certainly whoever put it together in its final draft would have had as much attentiveness as we do in reading it and notice, hey, how come it says of Hezekiah the same thing it says of Josiah, that there was never a king like him before or after him in terms of his devotion to God. I think what this points out is that there is a figure of speech that was used among the ancient Jews in writing. It was a hyperbole. But it was, like all hyperboles, it was an exaggeration for the sake of making an emphatic point. To say that someone was greater or uh, larger or wiser or more holy than anyone before or after, apparently in the Jewish usage, is not to be taken with a strict literalness. It probably means that there was no one anywhere near his own time who, who came close but to say never before or never afterward is, I mean, that sounds absolute, but it apparently is not intended as absolute. And that is simply to say that we're looking at hyperbole here. And it's okay. There are hyperboles used in Scripture, just as there are in all literature, including our own. But the reason I harp on this a little bit is because, for one thing, it used to bother me. Back when I was concerned, I didn't recognize the Jewish idiom so much and I hadn't looked into this particular one so much. I used to think it was a contradiction in the scripture, which I didn't believe could exist. And I realize now, having looked at the way this idiom is used again and again in scripture, that those who use it are not intending to be taken overly literally when they say there's never been anything like it before or afterwards. And in fact, when Jesus speaks of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD in Matthew 24, he said, then shall be great tribulation such as never was since the world began, nor ever again shall be afterward. The same expression. And, of course, uh, when we talked about that on another occasion, I made it clear that I, I would be willing to say that what happened to the Jews in Jerusalem in 70 AD may well be uniquely disastrous in history. There may be, in fact, nothing like it before or after it exactly. However, there have been things that were similar. Certainly the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians is very similar. And uh, some people would argue that what Jesus spoke of must be yet future because there hasn't been one individual event that stands out as being worse than all others in history yet. So they say this tribulation of which he spoke must be yet far worse than anything ever before. However, I think that is a failure to take into consideration this typical use of this kind of idiom among the Jews. It is said both of Hezekiah and Josiah that no king before him 
and no king after him was as holy or devoted to God as he was. Both of them were truly the best, holiest kings that Judah had. But it would be impossible for us from the data given to know which was a better king. Uh, neither of them was absolutely perfect. Both of them died somewhat uh, after making a, a, a tragic mistake. We haven't yet read of uh, Josiah's death, but we will in a moment. We know that Hezekiah made a mistake of showing the Babylonians his uh, treasures, and that was uh, perhaps his, his, uh, the last mistake mentioned of him. And also here, we'll read of um, Josiah's end. He, he kind of blew it at the end, too. In verse 26... 2 Kings 23, 26 says, Nevertheless, the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of his great wrath with which his anger was aroused against Judah because of all the provocations which Manasseh had provoked him, with which Manasseh had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will also remove Judah from my sight as I have removed Israel and will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen and the house which I said, of which I said, my name shall be there. That's interesting that Josiah's reforms pleased the Lord, but not enough to call off the judgment. Now, <clears throat> Jeremiah the prophet said in Jeremiah 18, verses 7 through 10, that if God ever proclaimed destruction against a nation, if they would turn from their wickedness, he would repent of the evils he said he would do to them. He demonstrated that very principle. In Nineveh, when Jonah proclaimed destruction and they repented, and he repented of the destruction he said he'd bring. This is a general policy with God, according to Jeremiah 18, verses 7 through 10. Now, why wouldn't that be true in Judah? Manasseh had provoked God to anger. Prophecies were made that God would destroy Jerusalem. But now it looks like the nation has turned back to God. Why would he not then repent of the evil he said he would do? We read that even though Josiah did all these good things, Yet God did not turn away from the fierceness of his great wrath because of the anger which was aroused. And it is specifically said it was because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. Well, that was a couple kings back. How come God's still holding it against Judah that Manasseh did those things? And Manasseh himself even repented and tried to undo much of what he'd done wrong. I think we have to understand that the things that were introduced by Manasseh were so deeply ingrained in the people's hearts that even though they had a godly king who uh, basically enforced religious reforms, the heart of the people was not with him. They were still more bound in their hearts to the things Manasseh had introduced. And although it may have looked like the nation of Judah was repenting, in their hearts, most of the people were not really repenting. The things that Manasseh had introduced were still there. And that becomes clear... I mean, not the outward forms, because Josiah was tearing those down, but in their hearts. Because after Josiah died, we have the nation turning back again to all of its former sins. So, uh, Josiah's reform saved him, and maybe others who were of like mind with him, but did not save the nation. Now, verse 28, Now the rest of the acts of Josiah, and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And in his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, <coughs> went to the aid of the king of Assyria, to the river Euphrates, and King Josiah uh, went against him, and Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo when they confronted him. Then his servants moved his body to a chariot from Megiddo, in a chariot from Megiddo, and brought him uh, to Jerusalem, and buried him in his own tomb. And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, his son, and anointed him and made him king in his father's place. Now, in fact, you, you might wonder why would Josiah go to uh, oppose the Egyptians who were going up to aid the Assyrians? Well, at this time, it says they were fighting at the Euphrates. Who was Assyria fighting against? It does not say who Assyria was fighting against here, but we can be quite sure that who Assyria was fighting against was Babylon. In this general time, Babylon, which was bordered by the Euphrates, was rising up against Assyria and was taking territory. It was at this time that the, the region was being conquered by Babylon and the Assyrians were fighting for the retention of their empire, but not very successfully. 
And uh, so the Egyptians were on their way up to help Assyria. Because although the Egyptians and, Syria, and, and Assyria had not been friendly to each other, the Egyptians apparently preferred for Assyria to retain power rather than have Babylon come to power. So Pharaoh Necho of Egypt was on his way up with some armies to reinforce and help Assyria. Now, for some reason, Josiah didn't want this to happen. Apparently, Josiah wanted the Babylonians to win this war, did not want Assyria to win, did not want Necho to help Assyria. And so he wanted to go out and stop them. Unfortunately, Josiah was, uh, was warned by a prophet not to go. If you had turned to uh, the 35th chapter of Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 35.20 says, After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish by the Euphrates. Now, that was a, the Battle of Carchemish, I believe, was uh, 605 or so B.C. And this is where the Babylonians conquered the Assyrian uh, power. I believe it was 605. It was the Battle of Carchemish. And Josiah went out against him. But he sent messengers to him, saying, What have I do to do with you, king of Judah? Uh, I have not come against you this day, but against the house with which I have war. For God commanded me to make haste, refrain from meddling with God, uh, who is with me, lest he destroy you. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself, so that he might fight with him and did not heed the words of Necho from the mouth of God. So, Pharaoh Necho, though he was not what we usually think of as a prophet, he was a pharaoh, yet he spoke from the mouth of God. It was a prophetic warning to Josiah, keep out of this. I don't have any quarrel with you. Stay out of this or you'll get yourself killed. But he didn't listen. So he came to fight in the valley of Megiddo, and the archers shot King Josiah. And the king said to his servants, Take me away, for I am severely wounded. His servants, therefore, took him out of the chariot, and put him in a second chariot that he had, and they brought him to Jerusalem. So he died and was buried in one of the tombs of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. It says in verse 25, Jeremiah, that, that would be the prophet Jeremiah, also lamented for Josiah. And to this day, all the singing men and singing women speak of Josiah in their lamentations. They made it a custom in Israel. And indeed, they are written in the laments. Sad, godly king, one of the best, and yet, he foolishly goes out and intervenes to fight against Nico, even though Nico, speaking the words of God, tells him not to. Um, just a mistake. I'm sure Josiah is still saved, but uh, kind of a dumb mistake that cost him his life. Now, even though Josiah lost his life, he may have won his object. He wanted to keep the Egyptians from getting there to help the Assyrians, and it, apparently his story indicates that the Egyptians didn't come uh, to the aid of Assyria. Perhaps by being uh, locked into battle with Judah, they lost too much precious time and maybe even too much precious manpower. So they called off the, uh, the campaign. So if Josiah wanted to give Babylon the advantage, he managed to do it, though it cost him his life to do it. Megiddo is the place where he fought with Pharaoh Necho. That is the same place where Armageddon, the word Armageddon actually means the mountain of Megiddo. And that was a place where many wars in the Old Testament were fought, but the most famous thing in the Old Testament that Megiddo is famous for is that Josiah was killed there. And of course, in the New Testament, the most famous thing for which Megiddo is remembered is that there is a battle of Armageddon uh, mentioned in Revelation 16. And uh, so those, the, the, the valley is famous in the Old Testament for the death of Josiah taking place there, and in the New Testament for a battle involving many nations described in Revelation. Now back to 2 Kings 23:31. Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, was 23 years old when he became king and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. Now, that, this time it's not the same Jeremiah, the prophet, because <coughs> that Jeremiah was not of Libna. And uh, also that Jeremiah didn't have a wife or a daughter. <coughs> Because Jeremiah, the prophet, was told by God not to marry. So he didn't. It was a different Jeremiah. 
And he, Jehoahaz, did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. Now Pharaoh Necho put him in prison at Riblah, in the land of Hamath, that he might not reign in Jerusalem. And he imposed on the land a tribute of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. Then Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, uh, that would be the brother of the de- deposed king, king in his place, in the place of his father Josiah, and changed his name to Jehoiakim. And Pharaoh took Jehoiakim and went to Egypt, Jehoi- excuse me, Jehoahaz, and went to Egypt, and he died there. Now, we're not told exactly why Pharaoh Necho came in and intervened in the monarchy of Judah at this time. But it was not very long after he had killed Josiah. Josiah died in battle. His son reigned only three months. And then Pharaoh Necho, who must have still been in the area, decided since there was a weak king that he could overcome in Jerusalem to depose him. But he put another son of Josiah in his place. Now, it may be that Jehoahaz... Uh, had had designs of going out to war against Pharaoh Necho also, which he never, which never materialized. Something about the rule of Jehoahaz bothered Necho, and so Necho came and took him away captive into Egypt before he died, and replaced him with his brother Eliakim, who is uh, after renaming him known as Jehoiakim. The last king of Judah was named Jehoiakin, which is a similar sounding name, <coughs> but different. So Jehoiakim gave the silver and the gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give money according to the commandment of Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and gold from the people of the land, from everyone according to his assessment, to give it to Pharaoh Necho. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebudah, the daughter of Padiah of uh, Rumah. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. Now, this coming of Nebuchadnezzar is the first incursion of Babylon that we find in the narrative. Babylon had conquered Assyria and now is pressing down into uh, the Middle East. Nebuchadnezzar may not yet have been king, but he was commanding the armies under his father, the king of Babylon. And uh, this, was, this was actually the year 605 B.C. So I, I told you earlier that the Battle of Carchemish I thought was in 605. I'm still not sure if that's true. If it is, then uh, all this happened rather quickly. But I think, I think maybe I was wrong. Maybe by, the Battle of Carchemish might have been... Um, in 608, but I, I, I'm afraid I, I can't speak with... Uh, I, my memory fails me on the Battle of Carchemish. But I know that this event here is 605 B.C. because this is the first of three invasions that Babylon made against Jerusalem. This one uh, did not result in very much bloodshed, it would appear, but just resulted in Nebuchadnezzar making Jehoiakim a vassal for three years. and he, uh, But then uh, Jehoiakim foolishly rebelled after three years against him. And the Lord sent against him raiding bands of Chaldeans, bands of Syrians, bands of Moabites, and bands of the people of Ammon. He sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servants, the prophets. Surely at the commandment of the Lord, this came upon Judah to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done. And also because of the innocent blood that he had shed, for he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood which the Lord would not pardon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Jehoiakim rested with his fathers. Then Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his place. And the king of Egypt did not come out of his land any more, for the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt from the brook of Egypt to the river Euphrates. And that would be entirely the land that had been promised to Abraham's descendants. Now Babylon controlled it, though Babylon had not yet destroyed Jerusalem. In 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came down, and it's not stated here in verse 1, but we learn in the book of Daniel that when Nebuchadnezzar came down at this time, he took several captives 
back into Babylon with him when he left. And those captives included Daniel himself. Uh, it's in Daniel chapter 1 <clears throat> that we read of what, ba- what Babylon did or what Nebuchadnezzar did on this occasion. Daniel 1.1 1, 1 says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, that's Babylon, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure of the house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking and gifted, in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace. So some of the kings, some of the royal seeds, some of the nobles, uh, were taken captive back to Babylon. <clears throat> and we find that among those that were taken on that occasion in 605 B.C. were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel himself. Apart from that, though, very little damage was done. Uh, Jehoiakim apparently surrendered without much of a fight, couldn't, couldn't resist uh, the, the power of Babylon, and so he just lost some citizens and some family members. But that was about it at that time. But in verse uh, when it says verse 5 now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim all that he did are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah actually there's very little on Jehoiakim in the book of Kings but there's quite a bit on him in the book of Jeremiah uh, as, when you study the book of Jeremiah you'll find that Jehoiakim is, uh, is the king the evil king that persecutes Jeremiah much of the time but there's very little of that in the historical books now verse 8 Jehoiakim now, this is the son of Jehoiakim, and Jehoiakim is also known in Scripture as Kaniah, which is a short form of Jeconiah. And in the Scriptures, you will find him called by all these names, Jehoiakim, Je- Jeconiah, and also just Kaniah, which is a shorter form of Jeconiah. It says, Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother's name was Nehushta the daughter of El Nathan of Jerusalem. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. They never learned, do they? At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city as his servants were besieging it. Then Jehoiakim, king of Judah, his mother, his servants, his princes, and his officers went out to the king of Babylon And the king of Babylon, in the eighth year of his reign, took him prisoner. Now, apparently the siege starved him out. Jehoiakim was attacked. Uh, He was under siege. And apparently, under probably starvation conditions, the king surrendered. And he went out to the king of Babylon. This took place in 597 B.C. This is the second of three attacks against Jerusalem. by the Babylonians, this time taking the actual king into captivity. The first time, just some royal and noble people were taken. 597, that's the second second invasion of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. Ezekiel was one of the captives. There were 10,000 captives taken at this time. Along with Jehoiakim, about 10,000 others were taken, we shall find, and Among them was Ezekiel, who was about 25 years of age at the time and later became a prophet in Babylon. Verse 13, And he carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house, and he cut in pieces all the articles of the king of Israel had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. When did the Lord say that? Well, he said that to Hezekiah. When Hezekiah showed the emissaries from Babylon all the treasures that were there, uh, Isaiah had said to him, well, the day is coming when they'll take all these things and take them to Babylon. Well, here it was. It happened. He also carried into captivity all Jerusalem, all the captains and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land. So he left only a, a little bit of population there and took anyone who was worth anything out of the land. And he carried Jehoiakim captive to Babylon. 
<clears throat> the king's mother, the king's wives, his officers, and the mighty of the land he carried into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. All the valiant men, 7,000, and craftsmen and smiths, 1,000, all who were strong and fit for war, these the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. Now, most of the rest of the book, which isn't very much, has parallels in Jeremiah. Jeremiah tells the same story, and and so does uh, 2 Chronicles. But um, Jeremiah tells the remainder of this story in Jeremiah chapter 52. And uh, pretty much parallels what we're about to read in closing this book out. Also, Second Chronicles 36. Verse 17, Then the king of Babylon made Mataniah, Jehoiakim's uncle, king in his place, and changed his name to Zedekiah. Now, the reason they kept changing these guys' names is because it, it was a sign of subservience that a person had his name changed by a, a higher authority. The person who gives you a new name is the person who's in authority over you. And your wearing of his name is a sign of your subjection. So he took these men. He, he didn't give them uh, Babylonian names. He gave them Jewish names. But they were different names than the names they were born with, just as a symbolic gesture, probably, of showing that he's ruling, not them. So he took Mattaniah and Jehoiakim's uncle, king of, uh, in his place, and changed his name to Zedekiah. And Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. Uh, he also did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah. And he finally cast them out from his presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon, which was a very, very stupid thing to do. So uh, Zedekiah was set up as king mercifully by the king of Babylon. But after 11 years, he, or the ninth year, he decided to rebel. And we read of that as we come to chapter 25. But before we uh, read that, there's a few verses in the 36th chapter of 2 Chronicles that I would like to uh, call your attention to because they simply provide additional information about this time. 2 Chronicles 36, verses 13 through 21. It says of Zedekiah, he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear an oath by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the leaders of the priests and of the people transgressed more and more according to all the abominations of the nations and defiled the house of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. Here they've been hit twice hard by Babylon, invaded had most of their better citizens taken from them, including their king, and yet they just get worse and worse. It's just like the Jews under siege in 70 AD. It seems like no matter how bad things got, they never, they never got a clue. They never realized, hey, we better repent. Instead, it's as if they were just given over to demonic delusions and just got worse and worse. Verse 15, 2 Chronicles 36, 15. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Here he was angry at them, but he had compassion on them, so he sent prophets to turn them around if possible. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, that's Babylon, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on the young man or the virgin or on the aged or the weak. He gave them all into his hand. And all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and of his leaders, all these he took to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious possessions. And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So, um, 
This is the interpretation of the destruction of Jerusalem given by the writer of Chronicles. We read of it now in uh, chapter 25 of Second Kings. Now it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month of the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and camped against it. And they built a siege wall against it all around. So the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. It was 18 months approximately they were under siege. That's a long time to try to not get starved out. A year and a half. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then the city wall was broken through, and all the men of war fled at night by way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden, even though... The Chaldeans were still encamped all around against the city. And the king went by way of the plain. That is, King Zedekiah thought he'd escape. The wall was broken through. It doesn't say who broke through. The assumption is that the Babylonians finally broke through. But when it says the wall was broken through and then all the people fled through the wall, maybe the Jews broke through the wall to escape, uh, hoping to get out the back way. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, and they overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered from him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and they pronounced judgment on him. Then they killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with bronze fetters, and took him to Babylon. This guy asked for it. They gave him, they set him up as king, and he could have been king till dying of an old age and a natural death. But it was in God's heart to punish him because he was wicked. And so he foolishly rebelled. Last thing his eyes saw before they were put out was the death of his sons executed before his eyes. Horrible fate. He would have, of course, memories after his eyes were blotted out. I'm sure he'd have mental pictures, but probably none so vivid as the last thing he saw before he went blind. So he'd be tormented with that for probably the rest of his life. Now in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord and the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great men, he burned with fire. And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around. In the book of Jeremiah, It uh, goes into some detail about how this man showed compassion on Jeremiah because Jehoiakim had, uh, or actually I think finally Zedekiah had put Jeremiah into prison. Jeremiah was in prison more than once. Jehoiakim put him in prison, but so did Zedekiah. And so when the Babylonians took the kingdom from Zedekiah, Jeremiah, who was a political prisoner of Zedekiah, was treated favorably by the Babylonians because actually Jeremiah had told the Jews not to fight the Babylonians, but to accept this as a judgment from God and to surrender. Therefore, what Jeremiah had said brought him into favor with the Babylonians, and they actually gave him his liberty. They gave him the choice of going to Babylon and being cared for there by them or staying around at home if he wanted. And uh, this Nebuchadnezzar, who's mentioned here, who came and actually finally leveled the temple and all that, he uh, he showed particular friendship to Jeremiah uh, after after Jeremiah was released. It says, verse 11, Then Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried away captive the rest of the people who remained in the city and the defectors who had deserted to the king of Babylon with the rest of the multitudes. So some must have listened to Jeremiah and defected to Babylon like he told them to. It was that kind of counsel that got Jeremiah thrown in jail. It sounded treasonous against Judah. I mean, when... I mean, if, if, if the Chinese attacked America and someone stood up and said, Thus saith the Lord, you Americans surrender the Chinese, defect to their side, because this is a judgment of God on America, uh, that would obviously seem treasonous in time of war. And Jeremiah's words were so perceived, and that's why he went to jail. But apparently, his words were not without effect. There were some who had defected to Babylon, even as Jeremiah said to do. But the captain of the guard left some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers. The bronze pillars that were in the house of the Lord and the carts in the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried their bronze to Babylon. 
They also took away the pots, the shovels, the trimmers, the spoons, and all the bronze utensils with which the priest ministered, the fire pans and the basins, the things made with solid gold and solid silver, the captain of the guard took away, the two pillars, one sea, and carts which Solomon had made for the house of the Lord. The bronze of all these articles was beyond measure. The height of one pillar was 18 cubits, and the capital on it was of bronze, and the height of the capital was three cubits, and the network of pomegranates all around the capital were all of bronze. The second pillar was of the same uh, with a network. You'll remember, of course, uh, when those were described in the description of Solomon building the temple. And the captain of the guard, which we studied as recently as earlier this week, but seems like years ago now, because we've just covered about over 300 years of history in the past week. It seems like a very long time ago since we studied that portion, doesn't it? It does to me. Uh, And the captain of the guard took Sariah, the chief priest, Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three doorkeepers. He also took out of the city an officer who had charge of the men of war, five men of the king's close associates, who were found in the city, the principal scribe of the army, who mustered the people of the land, and sixty men of the people of the land, who were found in the city. So Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, took these things and brought them to the king of Babylon in Riblah. Then the king of Babylon struck them and put them to death at Riblah, in the land of Hamath. Thus Judah was carried away captive from its own land. So uh, some of the priests and royal people were taken alive by Zebu, uh, Nebuzaradan uh, and taken to Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar was given the privilege of personally striking them down uh, so their captivity was not the end of the story for them they were executed by their conquerors verse 22 then he made Gedaliah the son of Ahikam the son of Shaphan governor over the people who remained in the land of Judah whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left. Now, Gedaliah uh, figures in the story of Jeremiah, in in the book of Jeremiah. He was a friend of Jeremiah's. He he favored Jeremiah, even helped uh, keep him from getting killed once. Unfortunately, though, Gedaliah was a good man, but naive. And uh, he gets himself assassinated only because he will not believe a report that is given to him about his future assassin. He, He thinks too well of people. There was a man who plotted his death, and though Gedaliah was warned of it, uh, he did nothing about it because he didn't really believe it. It says, verse 23, Now when all the captains of the armies, they and their men, heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah governor, they came to Gedaliah at Mizpah. Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, Johanan, the son of Kareah, Sariah, the son of Tanhumath, uh, the Netophathite, Netophathite, that's what it is, and Jeazaniah, the son of uh, 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 Maacabite, uh, they and their men. And Gedaliah took an oath before them and their men <coughs> and said to them, Do not be afraid of the servants of the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. Now it happened in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Esh- Elishema, of the royal family came with ten men and struck and killed Gedaliah. The Jews and the Chaldeans who were with him at at Mizpah and all the people small and great and the captains of the armies arose and went to Egypt for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans had set up Zedekiah first and uh, actually had set up Jehoiakim first and he rebelled. They took him out. They set up Zedekiah and he rebelled. They took him out. And then they set up Gedaliah, and the Jews themselves assassinate him, which is going to make the Babylonians angry and see these Jews as more trouble than they're worth. So the people who survived when Gedaliah was killed fled, mostly to Egypt. Uh, Jeremiah was among them. Now, Jeremiah actually counseled these people, don't go to Egypt. Uh, But they forcibly took him with them. They forced him to go, and he didn't want to. Now, I mentioned that Gedaliah had been warned about this man Ishmael. This we know from the narrative in Jeremiah chapter 52, where the same story is being told. And um, I believe it's uh, Jeremiah that tells it. Maybe it's... uh, Maybe it isn't Jeremiah. Maybe it's uh, 
maybe it's over in Chronicles. I forget. It must be in Chronicles, because I guess Jeremiah doesn't seem to have that there. Let me look over and see if I can find it. It must be 36 of Chronicles. I remember it from somewhere. Just made a mistake of where it's from. Let's see. Well, I don't see it there either. Where did I get that? I'm afraid I don't know where I got that. But I know it's true. <laughs> I guarantee you that. I just I thought it was Jeremiah that recorded it. I don't, I don't, uh, don't see it there in Jeremiah 52. Uh, maybe I can find it. Uh, I still think it's in Jeremiah, but it might be in another place. I'm, I'm not too short on time here, so I'm going to just take a moment and see if I can locate it here. Uh, Okay, here we go. It is Jeremiah, but it's not in chapter 52. It's in Jeremiah 41. Okay, let me just read that to you, because this tells you a little bit more about the events surrounding the death of Gedaliah. Our chapter 40... Yeah, okay, we got it, we got it here. Uh, chapter 40, verse 13. It's in chapter 41 that we see the assassination, but the warning of it is in Jeremiah 40, verse 13 through 16. It says, Moreover, Johanan, the son of Kerea, and all the captains of the forces that were in the fields came to Gedaliah at Mizpah and said to him, Do you certainly know that Baalus, the king of the Ammonites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to murder you? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, did not believe them. Then Johanan, the son of Korea, spoke secretly to Gedaliah in Mizpah, saying, Let me go, please, and I will kill Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and no one will know it. Why should he murder you, so that all the Jews who are gathered to you would be scattered and the remnant of Judah perish? In other words, Johanan knew that if Ishmael carried out his plot, since Gedaliah was the governor appointed by the Babylonians, that this would be an act of treason against Babylon, and then whatever few Jews were left behind in the last military incursion against them by Babylon would be wiped out by a, a later uh, retaliation from the king of Babylon. But Gedaliah the son of Ahikam said to Johanan the son of Korea, you shall not do this thing for you speak falsely concerning Ishmael. So Gedaliah was a, a good guy but he, he just couldn't believe anyone could be so bad as Ishmael and he trusted him unfortunately to his own undoing because Ishmael did come and kill him. And that is what brought uh, the final flight of the remaining remnant that was in Jerusalem down to Egypt to avoid problems of uh, Babylon coming down and uh, paying them back for killing Gedaliah. Now, the last few verses in Second Kings, uh, chapter 25, verses 27 through 30 say, Now it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month. That evil Merodach, king of Babylon, this is 37 years after the conquest of Jerusalem, so it's a different king of Babylon, but Je Jeconiah is still alive, or Jehoiakim. Um, that, in the, that evil Merodach, king of uh, Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, released Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim changed from his prison garments and he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. And as for his provisions, there was a regular ration given him by the king, a portion for each day all the days of his life. Now, there is no explanation of the significance of this here, that Jeconiah, or, or Jehoiakim as he was called also, was released from prison by a later king of Babylon, but he was not sent back to Jerusalem. He was never made king again. He lived and died in Babylon. But he was at least treated differently. He took off his prison garments and was given probably royal garments. And he was allowed to eat at the table with the king of Babylon with other kings. Apparently, it was the policy of evil Merodach to take all the kings, or at least some of them, that had been captured by Nebuchadnezzar and bring them to a more regal end. Let them come and eat at his table. They're still prisoners, but treat them in a more regal fashion. Now, there would be probably a couple of reasons for the king of Babylon wanting to do such a thing. One would be that it would certainly make him look 
more powerful to have all these subject kings at his table that were subservient to him. Uh, bring them out in the open so everyone could see that all these kings had been captured by him. If they're hidden away in prison somewhere, um, it's not as evident how many kings have been, have been conquered. And so to have them at his table with him at the head was simply a way of him graphically demonstrating that he was ruling over this many kings. It's also possible that kings in general wanted to treat other kings with some measure of respect, just so that the whole institution of monarchy might not be fallen into contempt. If people began to have contempt for any monarch, that contempt might begin to erode confidence in the divine right of kings to reign, and therefore their own king might be uh, you know, looked at with suspicion and might and his right to reign may be questioned. Um, there, you know, kings had to kind of stick together, even if they're enemies, that they all had the same delusion they had to promote in their citizenry, and that is that they were special people to be treated with honor. And, uh, and if, if conquered kings were treated like prisoners, hey, people could put two and two together. Hey, if those kings could be prisoners, our king could be a prisoner. If those kings can be reduced to nothing, our king could be reduced to nothing. Uh, kings have something to gain by perpetuating the delusion that they are almost divine humans. And therefore, to treat other kings with some respect is, uh, is good for all kings in general, rather than to demean and to diminish the dignity of the office. And that may be one reason why Evil Merodach did this. You know, remember when Jehu killed Jezebel and went in to eat, he said to his friends, well, let's go ahead and give her a burial. After all, she's the daughter of a king. Um, she was a wicked woman and his, and his enemy. But he thought, well, she does have royal blood. We should treat her with a measure of respect. And that apparently was, in, in times where there were kings, the way that rulers often felt. Like you shouldn't be too hard on other kings because, after all, the tables may turn someday and kings, uh, in some measure, have to stick together. Anyway, uh, this elevation of Jehoiakim from prison to a somewhat more privileged position in Babylon probably served as a, as a token that God gave the Jews in Babylon that there would be favor on them again. They were there for 70 years and, and, uh, and they may have felt like there was no hope of them ever getting out and after they'd been there for about 37 years. Uh, when their king is let, let out of prison and treated with some respect, perhaps God gave that to them as sort of a token of his not being absent from them. He's still aware of them and he still plans to show mercy to them. Now you might say, well, boy, Jehoiakim doesn't deserve to be treated that way. He's a wicked king. True, but he did spend 37 years in, in captivity. It's twice as long as some of you have been alive. Uh, imagine being in a prison for that long, 37 years. So he didn't, it, he didn't get away scot-free. But his punishment apparently was considered to be enough after 37 years of incarceration so that he was released. The Babylonian captivity then continued for 70 years total. Daniel was in Babylon during that time, and he was elevated to high government office because of his ability to interpret dreams, similar to Joseph in Egypt before him. And Ezekiel was a prophet to the exiles. He was not elevated to office. He just lived among the, uh, among the captives there. But God spoke through him, too. And uh, Daniel, re Daniel and Ezekiel both received revelations of God's purposes. Some of them were rebukes to the Jews who were still idolatrous in their hearts and some of them were words of encouragement to them about God's eventual vindication of his people. Uh, and both Ezekiel and Daniel spoke of the eventual coming of the Messiah but also of the release of the Jews from captivity. So that's where this book leaves them. It's the books of Ezra and Nehemiah that tell of the return of many of the Jews from captivity at the end of this time, though, though there never was a time when they all came back. Uh, even when the Babylonian captivity per se ended, only a, uh, a very small minority of the Jews who had been taken away ever came back to Jerusalem. The land of Israel was repopulated by Jews after this time, but, but there were still more Jews abroad in other countries that remained there and never returned there, so that in the days of Jesus there were more than twice as many Jews living in foreign lands than there were in, in Israel. And uh, that's still the case, of course, today. Okay, well, that's uh, 
that's our whole treatment of the book. I wasn't sure if we'd get through it in the number of sessions we'd allotted, but we managed to do it, so we can congratulate ourselves a little, or thank God, and uh, take an early break. <laughs>